and ministering in a COVID safe way, of course. God bless you. God bless you. Well, I want to introduce to us this morning uh, the theme for this next month of August. Okay, we're coming out of a, a season on revival. Revival and what revival looks like in the church. There's, a, there's fresh momentum in our church of things that God's doing. And so the, the theme for this coming month is more than Sundays. More than Sundays. Now, our church used to meet at the Kiwana Community Centre and we were after another denominational church. And that went from 8 till 9. And then our church went from 10 till 11.30. And it was quite interesting to watch uh, that particular church at, at 9.01 Everybody bolted out of church, uh, apart from about a, a, a handful of 10 or 12 core people. Every, and the car park just emptied quickly because for so many of those people, they had a religious mindset that I go to church to tick the box, to say my Hail Marys, to get, you know, to, to get moving on. And hopefully that gets me enough credit to kind of get through all the stuff I'm going to do this week so I can come back again and say, oh, I've sinned, bless me, and away we go again. And, it was, and there was some, obviously in the middle of that some really sincere God seekers, but a lot of the people saw their Christian experience as a one hour service on a Sunday morning and that was it. And I want you and I to know, Sundays are vitally important for the, for the church. They are, Jesus instituted that on the, the day He was resurrected, that the church would meet to celebrate together. And so we meet on Sundays to start the week right, to honour God, to love God, to meet together, to make sure we're calibrated to the ways of the kingdom. But it doesn't stop with a one and a half hour service on Sunday. Uh, Christianity and revival is about more than Sundays, more than Sundays. And so I want us to read what happened in the very first revival of the church. The very first revival happened after Pentecost Sunday, where the Holy Spirit fell. They were speaking in tongues. There was miracles. There was a move of God. 3,000 people got saved in one day. The church was birthed. And away we go. And this is the pattern of what church would look like that we got from the early church. It's in Acts chapter 2. I'm just going to read two verses. There's a lot there. But it says this in 2 verse 42. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so the, the, the Word of God, the leadership that God had put there, their teaching, to fellowship, which is spiritual friendship and connection, to the breaking of bread, uh, which was the Lord's Supper. So what Jesus said, I want you to break bread and remember me. So they were breaking bread, sit, drinking together. Really, that, that was meals that they were enjoying. And to prayer. The four cornerstones of the church in revival are those four things. Teaching the Word of God, fellowship, connecting one, to get one another, with meals reflect, reflecting on what Jesus has done, and prayer. And then verse 46, it says, and every day. Somebody say every day. Every day. Go on, every day. More than Sunday. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They were too big to get inside the temple, so they met in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Come on, someone, go and put some fresh bread in the oven, right? Or after church, not right now. Stay focused, don't multitask. They had bread, come on, and they went from house to house to house. I love that. Not in lockdown, but they went from house to house to house, and they ate together. I love this. The marks of a church in revival look like this. There's a deep love for one another. You can't tell me that you're in revival or going deeper in your relationship with God and not have a deeper love for the church and for your brothers and sisters in the house of God. You can't tell me I'm getting more spiritually mature, but I don't need church. It's the opposite. It's an oxymoron. It does not work. Number two, the mark of a church in revival was sacrificial giving. That's a whole other message, but they were literally giving stuff to look after one another's needs. Number three, there were signs and wonders happening. Miracle, 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 signs and wonders. Number four, there was a passionate hunger for prayer and the Word of God. Every day they had prayer meetings, not just for the 21-day prayer and fast. Every day they were together in the Word of God. Number, number five, they had a high-level commitment to gathering together. 
It wasn't an optional extra. It wasn't something we do a couple of times a month. If your uh, Christianity is based on meeting together a couple of times a month, I tell you, the fire will go out very quickly. Man shall not live by podcasts alone, but by every word that comes from the Word of God and being together with one another. All right. Then uh, here's the other thing. And people were being added to the church daily. Being added to the church. Why do they get added to the church daily? Because they were meeting together daily. There was this rhythm of life, of doing life together and one to another. They weren't trying to fit church in somewhere into their life. Church was their life. The, called out, the church is not a meeting. It's the called out group of one another believers for the purpose of Jesus. So church was central to their world and they built their life around that rather than trying to squeeze it in between sport, nippers, business, school runs and everything else. They built their life around church. All right, how are we going this morning? So I want to tell you one of, the, one of my favourite stories that's in the Old Testament that's a picture particularly, and today I want to talk about uh, the table. The, the, the title of my message is Make Room at Your Table. More than Sundays, make room at your table. This idea that they shared meals on a daily basis is, is something that a number of years ago I coined this phrase called sacred hospitality. Sacred hospitality. Sacred hospitality is, is not just having friend, uh, some meals with your same friends over and over again. Yeah. Now, we all need good friends that we can laugh with, we can have fun with, we can hang out with. We all need those kind of friends. But sacred hospitality is more than just meals and holidays with some good friends. Sacred hospitality is where we meet together and include people around our table, our lounge room, in our home and in our lives with Jesus at the center of the hospitality. It's, more, it's, more, it's about more than just the food. It's about the, what happens in our hearts in connection in including those who maybe wouldn't normally be included. Sacred hospitality. The story in Samuel of Mephibosheth. Say that out loud, Mephibosheth probably wrong for we non-Jewish people, but that's, that's what I'm going with today. Mephibosheth was uh, Saul's grandson. Saul was a king before David became king. So Saul's son was Jonathan. Jonathan was best mates with David, and David eventually became the king. Now, Jonathan's son was Mephibosheth. Not sure what he was thinking when he named him. I'm not sure if there was like a, you know, when you name your baby, there's the, the best name for the baby's book. I'm not sure where Mephibosheth was in that book. I don't know if it was the most popular name for the baby, the year that Mephibosheth was born. I'm not even sure what they would call him for a nickname. Was it Mipha? Was it Shib? Was it, I don't know what they would call him. If he was an Aussie, he'd be Mipho. Mipho, come on, buddy. If, if he was an Aussie, if he was a Kiwi, he'd just be Cuz. Come on, Cuz. Cuz, Mif, just come on down. But he was a Mephibosheth. And the Bible says that when, David, when, when Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle and God transferred the kingdom from then over to David, that Mephibosheth's nurse or carer grabbed him and ran thinking that the, all the, the grandkids and descendants of Saul will be killed. So grabbed him in fear, ran out of the house. And he was five years old. They dropped him. And from that moment, he became crippled. I'm not, he must have become a, a paraplegic or something at that moment because he, he became crippled. He could, couldn't walk. He had to be carried everywhere. It, it, his life was changed forever in one specific moment. And so Mephibosheth is thinking, well, no longer am I, am I actually going to have the family line of royalty and all the benefits of royalty, but I need to fear for my life now because any good king who would, came and became king knew what, is what they had to do was wipe out all of the descendants of the previous kingdom so that they wouldn't rise up and, and try and take a claim on the throne and undermine them. But David, because of his friendship with Jonathan, was different. Let's read this from 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6. His name was Mephibosheth, and he was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. And when he came to David, David called for him. He bowed low on the ground in deep respect. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And he replied, I am your servant. David said, don't be afraid. Fear not. He's, he's trying to put him at ease. I didn't call you here to kill you. Don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you. 
because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. And I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. And Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you would show such kindness to a dead dog like me? His self-esteem was shattered. His fear was shattered. But he's like, really? You're, you're going to restore me financially? You're going to care for me financially? You're not just going to look after my physical needs. You're going to include me at your table. You're going to look after me. You're going to show me kindness. This is a type, this is a, a picture in the Old Testament of what Jesus does for you and I. Jesus comes and says, I, I know that you've been a bit messed up by the world. I know that some stuff has gone down. I know that you've been dropped. You know, I don't know, some people have told me, I think you were dropped on your head when you were born. I'm not talking about that. That's a little harsh. I just know, I just know that stuff's gone down in your life that's hurt you. It might not have physically crippled you, but it's emotionally crippled you, mentally crippled you. The way you think about yourself or look at yourself uh, can be so, so difficult, so, so challenging. People have said stuff to you and it's stuck. And when Jesus comes along, you're expecting Him to come, re representing God and to, to, to call down fire on you, to tell you you're not good enough, to tell you you're never going to make it, you, won't, you can't live up to God's standard, to rip things off you and to destine you to life without God. But Jesus, like David, comes and says, don't be afraid. Come on. Don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of the promise of my Father. The promise He's made is for you. Kindness, mercy, love. I'm going to include you. I'm going to, I'm going to let you sit at the, the table. Uh, the prodigal son came back to his father after rebelling against him, saying, I'm just a servant. And he said, no, you're not. You're my son and I'm going to restore you. Even though you smell like pigs, even though you've run away and stuffed up, the kindness of God draws us to repentance, the Bible says. And th this whole spirit of Jesus is demonstrated through David and Mephibosheth, saving us, being kind to us. Maybe you're watching today, uh, you, you've got nothing else to do, a friend shared this link with you, you're, and you're, like, you're feeling like, well, that's me. I feel like if I was to come to church, God would say, I'm gonna smite him, oh, the almighty smiter. You know, was it Evan Almighty, smite me, almighty smiter. God's just gonna take you out. Maybe, maybe you f feel like the roof would fall down if you came to church. I want to tell you that's not how God sees you at all. He's kind. He's loving. And He wants to heal you, restore you, and include you in relationship. That's what the table speaks of, relationship. The Bible tells us He even prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Everything else can be going wrong around about our life, but He will prepare a table of inclusion for you and I the end of this service, we're going to give you a chance to make a, begin a relationship with God, to pray a simple prayer that would change everything. I pray that you do that in that moment as we lead you into a new place for your life at God's table. So I want to talk about two things that Jesus did when He came that really are an outflowing of what I'm talking about today and became the pattern and the standard of the New Testament church. Two things that I think are very important for any kind of church that's in revival, any kind of church where God is moving powerfully, that we don't just think, well, that's all about uh, services of fire, power, and a quiver in our liver, and a good feeling around our life, but there's more than Sunday for you and I. The first thing Jesus did is He demonstrated what I'd like to call the gospel of inclusion. The gospel of of inclusion. Before Jesus came, there was a very clear hierarchical structure that people felt like they could not get into the approved ones. The, the religious people, there were 613 rules that they were inflicting on people, or ones that God had written, and then they made up a whole stack more called the oral laws. And they, no one could live up to the standards that people were putting on them. In fact, when, when Jesus came, one of the first things He said as a prophecy is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. 
If you were poor, that was already an obstacle between you and God. You couldn't measure up. If you were a leper, if you had skin conditions, you would be isolated. There was all sorts of reasons before Jesus came that people would be uh, separated from the elite of religion. And Jesus came and He messed it all up with the gospel of inclusion. He said, first, the gospel's for the poor. The gospel's for those who are poor in spirit. The gospel's for those who are, who are on the outside. The gospel's for those who are blind. The gospel's are for those who are hurting, those who are lame. I'm gonna come and heal you and help you. He, he, the, the, he just triggered the Pharisees who were the religious leaders of the day. He ate with, he ate with tax collectors. He ate with prostitutes. He ate with, with people who are, w- wouldn't even be accepted into the synagogues. He ate with them, demonstrating that the gospel is not, he said these words, I didn't come just for the, the healthy. They don't need a doctor. I came for the sick. And the way I'm gonna minister to the sick is not remotely, but by including them in my life. He included women on his team who traveled with him. At that point, women weren't included in any ministry or leadership, but he elevated women to the value equal to man that God had created them in. It's the gospel of inclusion. And so he began to teach. He included, he included children. Children weren't really valued up until the age of 12 uh, when they became, uh, th- there was a whole process of them becoming an adult and a, something that Jesus went through. But the disciples tried to separate him from the children. But what did he do? He included the children. Come, I'll bless you. I'll look after you. It's the gospel of inclusion. It's the gospel of kindness. It's the gospel of big, wide open doors into the kingdom of God of love and acceptance. And so he, he went and he said to the, the, in his teaching a couple of very specific things to, to make sure that the gospel of inclusion would continue. Luke chapter 14, verse 12, he was at a, a, a function, a hospitality moment. He turned to his host and said this, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, I feel like that's from the 70s. My, my, I know people say, we're gonna have a luncheon. So when you put on a party, let's just say, He said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbours, for they'll just invite you back. And that will be your only reward. Your reward will be, they came to my party and I went to their their party. He said, instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Invite those who can't have your back. Invite those who are socially awkward. Invite those who have been crippled through life and and feel anxious about connecting with people. Invite them and include them in your life. The power of inclusion, the the gospel of inclusion. That's the the thing that Jesus demonstrated and taught about. Later on, He said to to the disciples, He said, there'll come a day when you'll go to heaven and I'll say to you, thanks for looking after me when I was naked, when I was poor, when I was in prison, when I was destitute. Thank you for looking after me. And they said, well, Lord, Lord, when did we see you like that? And He said, when you did this for the least of mine, when you looked after the outcasts, when you included the, the, those in prison, those in poor, when you loved them with all of your heart, you were loving me and you'll get my reward. It is called the gospel of inclusion. The second thing that Jesus did, we're talking about make room at your table. The second thing Jesus did is He introduced the, what I call the power of the table. Powerful moments happen around the table. Now, the table doesn't need to be a $5,000 table from, from Freedom. The table can be a, 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 plas- a table of plastic chairs and plastic tables that you just set up because you couldn't afford anything else. I'll get to that in a moment. But the table is powerful. Jesus, four or five of the most intimate, powerful chapters of the Bible weren't preached from a pulpit from Jesus. They were shared around a table in an upper room. And it was recorded by John, all of these beautiful, intimate sayings. So often we think that the power of modern day church is is from the pulpit. And hey, I'm preaching from a pulpit right now. 
So it's not a matter about not, not believing in the power of the pulpit. The, the pulpit's powerful. How can people be saved unless there's preaching, the Bible says? How do we change lives unless we bring the Word of God alive from the pulpit? There's something powerful about pulpits that can get into homes and lives all around the country. We need the pulpit and the preaching of the Word. But equally, not just the pulpit, church, the platform, you've made it if you get a microphone and a pulpit. No, no, no. Equally, Jesus put on the same level the table. The pulpit and the table. The pulpit and the table. They met in the temple courts and they met from house to house. They met in the temple courts and they met from house. There was a pulpit or preaching of the Word of God and there was tables. And Jesus introduce the power of the table. He said, I want you to love one another, not just by giving them some cash or not just by dropping some money in the, in the bucket or not just by sending them a lovely text. He was ahead of his time, obviously. He said, I want you to, I want you to love people by including them where? At your table. In your home. At your table. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says this, and this is particularly I'm talking about the church at this point. Uh, there's another part B to this is, is where we include those who we're reaching. But right now I'm talking about the church. Uh, Paul writes to the church in Rome, says, don't pre- just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what's wrong. Hold tightly to what's good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Always. This is Paul. Church, always, always be eager. Practice hospitality. In fact, Paul said hospitality is so central to Christianity that if you're going to select some leaders and make them elders or deacons, uh, make sure that they, are, uh, they enjoy having guests in their home. Titus 1 verse 8. And say the same to Timothy. Must be given to hospitality is another phrase. Given to it. Not just occasional, but given to it. And the whole concept of given to hospitality is not just hospitality to your friends. In the Bible, what it literally means is hospitality to strangers. Hospitality to someone who needs a bed to stay in your house. Hospitality to someone who who, who needs including and loving and, and befriending. I grew up in a home where my parents weren't pastors. Every now and then, maybe I can remember my dad speaking at our local little uniting church with his tie and his his awesome tweed uh, sports jacket on. And he maybe maybe four or five times as a lay preacher they called him, or or a an elder in our little church in country Victoria. And I remember that my my dad and my mum their their power wasn't so much in the pulpit. They were prayers and encouragers, but boy did they know the power of the table. I grew up with salt of the earth Christian parents who'd been missionaries and loving people who just, who just would always include someone at the table. They, I, I remember that we, when we were in Toowoomba, a, a guy called Mr. John Tyler, he, he was in his 80s. Uh, he was a widower. He lived alone and my dad would uh, pick him up and bring him to church every Sunday. And then every Sunday for lunch, uh, if he was available, he would, Mr. Tyler would come to our home. And he didn't talk a lot. I don't remember a lot of what he said. I do remember because we were a big ice cream family. My dad loved ice cream. There was a Christian businessman who owned an ice cream factory in Toowoomba. So literally we had ice cream for dinner every night just to support the Christian businessman. Praise God. So we would, of course, have our meal and we'd have ice cream. And I remember Mr. Tyler because we'd have butterscotch ice cream. I think we call, Kiwis call it hokey pokey. And it, it was, I loved it. Except I don't think he realised that the butterscotch was a, was a sweet because he'd eat the ice cream and, spit, and put on the side of his bowl all the butterscotch bits. And it was kind of a little bit disgusting. But anyway, it was just kind of how it rolls. My parents would open up their home to uni students who, who were a little, you know, if I'm being kind, they might have made, a, made it to the show Beauty and the Geek. That, that, that might have just been the, the vibe of what was going on. And so we'd have all these, these uni students who would come to our house and, and mum and dad were like their mum and dad. A number of them didn't have family. And they'd come and they'd eat often on a Sunday night at our place and they'd, they'd eat the food that we prepared or a Sunday lunch or during the week and eat the food that mum had made, which was 
simple and basic. They would be shown kindness and conversation. We'd often play a game and it was family to them. It was the gospel of inclusion shown in a beautiful, powerful way, demonstrated to me. And I loved that. If we were sitting here all together in church right now, I'd do a pop quiz for you. I would ask you if you've been part of our church for more than four weeks, have you invited someone into your home in the last month who wasn't already a friend? I've got Teresa here saying, pick me, pick me, I've done that. That's awesome, Teresa. Thank you so much. Have you? Have you included somebody? Not just a friend. Not just someone you're comfortable with, but someone who's new and and separate. Let me ask you this question. And again, I would have loved to do this in the room. Have you been invited to someone? If you've been in our church for more than three months, has someone invited you to their home? Not just to their connect group, but to their home. Now, maybe it's a good thing I can't see hands today. But I would like to think that our church has the spirit of hospitality all over it that someone could not be here in our church for more than a month without being invited to someone's home for lunch after Sunday church or midweek or Saturday afternoon for a cup of tea or or whatever it might. I would love to think the spirit of revival has flown flown into the spirit of hospitality within our church. I wanna just debunk three myths right now as we talk about sacred hospitality. I want you to think about making room at your table making room at your table. The first myth that often can stop us being given to hospitality and including people we don't know is this. We, it's the master chef myth, myth. The master chef myth. You're like, oh, I'm a terrible cook or I can't afford fancy food. That's a myth. Fancy food is not what makes sacred hospitality work. It's not what makes. A proverb says this. Uh, it's, it, Proverbs says, you're better to have a meal of vegetables where there is love than meat when there is anger. Wow. Now, I'm, I, I believe the Bible, but I'm a meat lover. I just spent 21 days not eating meat. And I would not like to spend the rest of my life not eating meat because we all know that if God didn't want us to eat meat, He would not have given us cows and sheep. We all know that. Uh, but however, if you're a vegetarian, God bless you today as well. But I'm just talking for me. So, so better to just have vegetables if there's love than to have a brilliant me- meal and feast where there's no love. So the myth is not that you've got to be a brilliant chef, cook, or master chef. Okay, you, you don't have to put your food up on Instagram or social media. A roast chicken in a bag with some hot chips and a pre-made salad is awesome. Come on, somebody. Hey, uh, uh, just a cup of tea and a couple of biscuits, the good old Arnott's kind, that you have for afternoon tea. It doesn't have to even be a meal, but you're just, you're sitting around a table. That's enough. I mean, we had some, some people over we'd never had over uh, during the fast uh, into our home, and we had flipping carrot sticks and avocado and little, little, corn chippy things with no additives. It, was, hey, it wasn't about the food. It was a great job, babe. I appreciated it. But it wasn't about the food. It was about the love. It was about the connection. So if you're not a master chef, that myth is debunked. That's not an excuse. Number two, the better homes and gardens myth. Oh, when I get a nicer house, then I'll have people in my home. Uh, when, I, when, when, it, when the carpet's a bit dirty, and I'm a bit ashamed about it, you know, the marks because I'm renting and I can't do anything about it or we can't afford to upgrade. Or, the furniture's old. The lounge suite, there's dog hair on the lounge suite. Come on, there's, there's stuff. Our house is just, it's not the kind of house for entertaining. Myth. That's a myth. God doesn't say if you've got a perfect house, entertain. He says if you've got an open heart and love, have people in your home. When I was 20 years old, living on my own in Victoria, some of the most beautiful meals I have was with an older friend called Howard. He must have been about 45. He was was in a wheelchair the majority of his time. He would invite me around to his home and there were dogs everywhere and he just didn't believe in storage systems. There was stuff 
piled up everywhere, on seats, on table. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't a great cook. He'd make me a cup of tea. It was dirty, the cup, you know. Uh, but the, the beautiful, we talked about the Lord. We talked about the Bible. He encouraged me and I encouraged him. I was in a town of maybe 100 people and there was barely any Christians there. We needed one another. And I discovered that the power of the table beats generation gaps. Some of you are older folks in our church. You've got wisdom and life experience and you're wondering what's, what's God got for you. Is your time done? No, you've got a table. There's some 20-year-olds like me who, who aren't at home or have got no family or isolated. There's some 30-year-olds who are single moms and they need a grandparent figure. They, they just need you to include them at their table. Better homes and gardens myth, gone. Now, let me give you just a few practical tips about how to give yourself to sacred hospitality. Okay, just a few practical tips. Number one, atmosphere does matter, but atmosphere can be quite easy to set up. Just some, some worship music or some fun music playing creates atmosphere. That's, so, so pre-think that. Just get some atmosphere. Some, sometimes some candles can just change the, the aroma of a room. That can create a good atmosphere. Sometimes locking the pets outside when you have guests over, especially if you've got a dog like ours with no social skills. That can create atmosphere. When you're having people to your home, just real practical. Meet them at the door. Just go and welcome them and, and smile, no matter how stressed you are about all the preparation up until that moment. Meet them at the door and welcome them and hug them and say, so great to have you over. I'm just so glad we can spend some time together. People might be apprehensive about coming to your house and you're nervous about having, just meet them at the door. Learn from Martha and pre-prep. When Jesus came, Mary sat at His feet and Martha was stressing out in the kitchen because she thought the meal had to be amazing and awesome, but she missed the point of loving one another. So do the prep before people get there. Just simplify it and get it done beforehand or ask them to bring some food. Man, the potluck meal is an awesome thing. Yes. We'll do the meat, you do the salad. We'll do the biscuits and chips, you do the drinks. Just simplify it. So if you simplify, then you can do it more. Right. If it's a massive drama that's ir uh, that you're like, oh, I can only do that once a year. Right. You're doing it all wrong. You're just trying too hard. Simplify, pre-organize so when you're together, it's all about one another. Just simplify. Okay, if you're like, oh, I'm not really a hosty kind of person. I, I don't know what to say. Well, here we go. Invite some sanguines. Yeah. So just, so it doesn't, it, so hospitality doesn't have to be just one-on-one. -on -one. And it doesn't have to be you and another family. Uh, one of the magic mixes of great hospitality is include a few people. So that person who's bubbly and talks and, and, and is the life of the party, just make them, pay, include them. So, and, and you can include someone who is a friend, but include someone who you, none of you know yet. So that you're just getting the, the room dynamic of someone who, oh, now, not someone, if you're one of those people who just talk all the time, dial it back a bit and let someone have a shot. But let's get the mix right. So include some sanguine, extroverted people to make the atmosphere. Teresa wants an invite every night of the week. I can hear it right now. And I'm going to, because I'm trying to make this practical for us right now. So here's three questions that you could ask if you're having a meal together and you're having fun and you're getting to know each other. Tell me your story. I'll tell you my story. Amazing. But just here would be three things that you could ask. They're what I'd call conversation starters. You only have to ask one of them. And it can include kids as you're around a meal table. But ask this question. Hey, what are you thankful for right now? It's a simple question. What are you thankful for? And just, oh, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that about you. Oh, that's fascinating. That's awesome. What are you thankful for? Another question could be, what are you loving about our church right now? Because you're inviting people from church. This is the sacred hospitality of believers. What are you loving about our church right now? Away we go. We're keeping it buoyant. We're keeping it live. We're, we're looking to see where God's moving in, in each other's lives. That's, that's the difference between hospitality and sacred hospitality is the tone of the conversation. Maybe a question could be, if I was going to pray for you, what would you like God to do for you right now? Just to, you don't have to ask all of these, but just 
one of those could just, just help the conversation, keep it flowing. So here's my challenge for us today, church. Would you commit to sacred hospitality on a regular basis? For someone you might say, I could do it every Sunday after church. Every week I can open my, my home and up for sacred hospitality, for new people, and connecting people to each other. Someone might go, I couldn't do that, but I could every month on a Saturday afternoon, on a Saturday breakfast, Sunday lunch after church, a, a midweek night. Once a month, you could include someone for sacred hospitality. Can we